In this episode of Mind Pump, we answer fitness questions from listeners like you. What they did is they went to our Instagram page, Mind Pump Media. They posted a question underneath the mm. Qua meme. We're so interactive. We picked four of them and then we answered them. But the way we open this episode is with our introductory conversation where we cover current events, studies, our lives, and we tend to also mention some of our sponsors. And farts that kill mosquitoes. Here's what we talked about in this episode. We started out by talking about retinoids. Retinoids are compounds that you can put on your skin to make your skin look younger. Some of these are found in nature. Uh, there's a company that we're working with called Caldera. They make a face serum that seems to be making Adam look younger. Look at that baby face. Look at that. Six months younger. The chubby cheeks. Now, Caldera is one of our sponsors. If you go to Caldera Lab, that's C-A-L-D-E-R-A-L-A-B.com forward slash mind pump, you'll get a full 20% off your first Caldera Lab purchase of their products. Then we talked about being intimidated by the gym. Uh, we often get messages from people who say they want to work out, but going to a gym is just a bit intimidating, especially as beginners. So we talked about the value of working out at home. Unfortunately, getting home gym equipment has been in the past very expensive. You got to pay the whole thing up front and it takes up a ton of space. Not anymore. Not anymore. PRX, one of our sponsors, makes equipment that folds into the wall. The profile is tiny. You can fit it in almost any room. Um, and you can also do a payment plan with their equipment, like paying a gym membership. So you have a full gym in your garage that folds up against the wall. You can still park your car in there, pay monthly, and you're set. Uh, PRX is one of our sponsors. If you go to prxperformance.com forward slash mind pump, and use the promo code Mind Pump, you'll get 5% off your purchase and a free MAPS Prime program with the purchase of $500 or more. Then we talked about exercise and happiness. Study shows that exercising makes you happier than making a lot of money, which is kind of cool. Whoa. We talked about the $4 million lawsuit uh, that CrossFit won against NSCA. Good for you guys. We talked about cryptocurrency and how that's the future. I talked about a, uh, an article I read about a woman who caught her boyfriend cheating because she watched his Fitbit. That's funny. Beware, guys. Then Beware. Justin talked about an article that was extremely fascinating to him. Apparently, a man in Uganda can kill mosquitoes with his fart. <laughs> I talked about <laughs> how superpower. a man got a bone marrow transplant and it changed the DNA of his sperm. That's crazy. And then we talked about the Joe Rogan podcast with uh, Wilkes versus Cresser. Um, debating game changers versus eating a balanced omnivore diet. Um, and then we got into the fitness portion of this episode. The first question was, what's the difference between the front shoulder press and the behind the head overhead shoulder press? Like, what's the difference? Which one's better? Which one's worse? Next question, uh, why do lifters arch their back during a bench press? Is there any benefit to this um, or value? The next question, what are the pros and cons of doing a super set? That's where you combine two exercises into one big set. You make them super. And the final exercise was, uh, excuse me, final question was, do we think that gamification, like the Fitbit or other types of technology, uh, have value? Do they build long-term habits? So we had a nice little discussion to in debate in that part of the episode. Also, this month... If you're, looking, if you're looking to shape and sculpt your body as you see fit, if your main motivation for working out is to achieve a body that looks phenomenal, in other words, you're really concerned with aesthetics, we have the program for you. It's called MAPS Aesthetic. It was inspired by bodybuilding, physique competitor, and bikini competitor type training. That program is 50% off this month only. Here is how you get that discount. By the way, it's a full program. Everything, videos, demos, blueprints, everything. It's got three phases. Again, it's phenomenal. Here's how you get the discount. Go to mapsblack.com. That's M-A-P-S-B-L-A-C-K.com and use the code BLACK50, B-L-A-C-K-5-0, no space, for the discount. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Doug, you give us a thumbs up when we're... Do something more original. Than when we're up. hot and ready. Give us like a bird flapping signal or something. Yeah, or a peck dance. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, give us something... Yeah. Oh, 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 there, oh, there it is. Uh, there you go. Yeah. Doug's got some pecs one, on him. One, two, one, two. Yeah. Mic he, check, he, mic he's check. Booties. Yeah, he's got some, he's got some pecties. Double check, double it's, check. Uh, I'll tell you what, man. Training Doug as a trainer was pretty awesome because simultaneously. Ta terrific. Not only did I get to train. Ta-ta Tuesday. The best client ever trained because mm. he's a fucking, the guy's a sponge. 
Mm. But also, I got to look at someone who inspired me. I think to myself, like, wow, if I could look like him. He's strong as a chimp. We, at his age, uh, I would be winning. I think I said this on the podcast about a year ago. We are maybe two, three years away at most of everybody thinking Doug is the youngest one in the group. Or, or, yeah. <laughs> For sure. It's pretty fucking close right now. Wait, wait, if, if, if maybe someone, like two years. If someone who's never heard Mind Pump ran into us and met us for the first time and yeah. you said, put our ages in, in order, Doug, pretty I don't, soon. I'm pretty sure pretty soon. Yeah. Doug would not get put as the oldest. No, and why are you right. looking at me like that? <laughs> <laughs> you know what it is? It's Part of it's the skin, which I, and I, I know... Adam, you're a little bit like, eh, I don't want to look old. There's a little bit of you that's a little, mm. I don't want to be older. You see me over I here. I want to look like a kid. You're trying to freeze yourself in you time now. Is that why you're rubbing, yeah. you're rubbing all serum? Day all, I'm rubbing serum all I'm over my face <laughs> as much as I can. You're rubbing all those retinoids <laughs> yeah, all, over yeah, your, yeah. all over your face. from the, Hey, yeah. dude, they say it's supposed to work, dude. I like it. I swear it feel better. Yeah, do you know yeah. what retinoids, uh, retinoids do? No, for the so for the skin. Hopefully, it's not like hemorrhoids. No. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Please, God, I don't want. Because I don't want that. I don't want hemorrhoids face. on my face. Yeah. yeah they t- uncomfortable. Hemorrhoids of the eyeball. Retinoids. Ah. Yeah. No, it's uh, retinoids, um, and they can be found. Some of them can be found naturally, like Caldera, for example. Um, and there's some synthetic ones. Um, the Caldera doesn't have the synthetic ones. You'd have to buy other ones. But anyway, what they do is they speed up the cell turnover process of your skin. So when you rub this stuff on your skin, mm. the cells die off faster and get replaced faster by younger looking uh, cell or by younger uh, cells, which then makes you look younger. So that's why you rub the stuff on and, you know, and they've done studies on this and they'll show that they do reduce the Ah. appearance of Ah. fine lines. Ah. Regenerating like a lizard. And wrinkles. You know, Katrina said something to me the other day. What'd she say? She said that I looked uh, six months younger. Wow. Uh, Six months? I'll take that. That's a start. Yeah. Wow, Mm. she's... Perceptive. How do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit! That's, it. That's my, very precise. Uh, my my birthday yeah. pickup line. There. Wait a minute. Well, hold on a second. Six hold months. on. Hold on a second. How old is your son? Huh? How old is your son? Four months. Oh, so it makes uh, sense. Yeah. Yeah. You look as young as you did before we had a dip fit. <laughs> <laughs> You're almost back. Which yeah, yeah, I mean, let's be honest. That accelerates you by oh like. Oh my god, bro. Yeah. Most people have a kid and they look like ten years older. You don't right tell away. us, dude. Yeah. 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 Like you look. Like I'm I going, mean, I dress young, but I am not. I do not look it. So I'm going the other direc- the other direction right yeah, now. Yeah. Yeah. That's impressive. Huh? I think we're not doing bad. Come on, man. We're all right, right? No, no, we're we're yeah, good. Until you look at old pictures. Oh shit! You know, and then you know, it's just like oh, there was that one picture of of Adam and I when we were doing a uh, the maps. Uh, it was a yeah, it was a commercial or some video we did for maps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like four or five years like ago, right when Adam was competing and everything. Yeah, it was and five years ago. Cut. And I yeah. look at the pictures and I'm like, wow, look at those two kids. And I'm like, wait a minute. Those young, handsome guys. Like, what are we, aging in dog years? What's going on here? <laughs> no gray hairs or nothing. I, it, I saw that. It looked, uh, it's whatever, you yeah. know. Yeah. Like, I don't know, Jessica tells me that uh, I'm looking better as I age. And, and I tell you what, that's why I love her because she she lies for my sake. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah, she's close to She you does it, sure. you know, well. You she's know always saying? like the older gentleman. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway. <laughs> so. anyway, I was, uh, um, you know, answering some DMs uh, this morning and uh, I forgot all about this. This is really fascinating. I want to see if you guys ever reached this conclusion as well. It took me a long time to figure this out. So, you know how it's normal for most people to be stronger on their dominant side, right? So, if you're right-handed, Right arm is going to be a little bit stronger, more sure. coordination. Uh, you know, you use it more, right? Right. You guys ever notice this though? When doing balance exercises like single leg toe touches, that somebody will balance better on their non-dominant side. You ever notice mm, that? Yeah. Well, okay. Do you do you understand why that normally is though? Right. I think I think I know why. Oh, uh, you're going to be wrong though. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Yeah, because it's related more to sports stuff. So go ahead. Oh tell, no 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 no. Hold on. That's yeah. exactly what it is. Oh yeah yeah yeah. So if you're let's say you're right-handed and you play soccer, you're going to be kicking with your right leg, which means you you'll plant, be balancing. Which means you plant with your left and you drive with your yeah, right. That's yeah, that's obvious. Yes. Oh well, fuck uh, obvious. Right. You guys. <laughs> <'Cause with sports. laughs> I mean, you're always yeah. That's the thing. Dude. So that's your, you that's your foot you're planting with. I, hey, not bad. To be able to open and swing your leg. I read two decades. Decades later, or jump into made, basketball and you made left a leg. sports connection. No, 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 That's no. Really I, I remember. I learned this. This is something I was able to communicate. I read uh, it in a book. No, 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 no. This was like 15 years ago. It was like maybe five years after How being to a do trainer. Sports ball. Because it would confuse me. I remember clients would have better. Yeah. You yeah, know. Yeah. yeah. But five years later, I was like, wait a minute. No, I remember. The, I I remember the same thing too. Yeah. Like because you would think that it would be like oh the same side, but it's like no, they're normally the sports you're planting on that side, and that therefore that side yes, you've got yeah. better now, stability and strength. Now right. speaking of DMs, uh, 
um, I got. Oh. I've had several of I've these. Had some fun ones. <laughs> what? What? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa! You just sold yourself out. Right? <laughs> Whoa! That's supposed to be a joke, Why and then you it got uh, real. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Do share. No, yeah, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I will. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no problem. Anyway, um, I've gotten this message many times, and I'm guilty of in the past. Um, you know, kind of discrediting it, or I would say communicating uh, against it in incorrectly or ineffectively, I should say. What do you mean? Well, one of the things that oftentimes that I would hear um, as a trainer was, you know, I don't like working out in gyms uh, because it's intimidating, or I don't like working out in the free weight area because it's intimidating. And what I used to say to these people was, I, I didn't empathize. This is before I really understood how to communicate well, and I, I wouldn't empathize. And I'd say things like. It's your body. Nobody cares. Go to the gym. Do your own thing. Don't worry about others type of deal. Um, and I think the reason why I communicated it that way is because I didn't fully understand what that felt like because I've been in gyms consistently since I was 16. To me, walking into any gym, I feel it's like home. I feel no intimidation. I go in there. It doesn't bother me at all. Um, I'll, in fact, this morning I worked out and I didn't. I mean, I got out of bed and went straight to the yeah. gym. Don't care how I look. I'm comfortable in that environment. Did but you start though? I, th I think I remember you saying you started with your cousin, like in your backyard. Was that how you started lifting weights? When I first started working out, it was in my backyard and in the garage. Right. And, I, and, and now when I first went to a gym, remember I was 16 year old fanatic. Uh -huh. I loved. By this point, I'd been two years working out in my garage and in my. My backyard. Oh, so you worked out for two years before you even made it to a gym. Correct. Oh, wow. And I was a fanatic. I was reading magazines. I was reading books. And so when I went to a gym, I was mm -hmm. excited. I had a different feel. I didn't feel intimidated. But a lot of people, that's a big thing, is that people don't like the environment. They don't like the fact that they have to wait for I equipment. I was thinking about this, too, because even, uh, like, I had been a part of, you know, various sports teams and, and, and we'd all work out together, but that was like my only introduction into the gym. And like, if I didn't have that, it would have been, it would have taken a lot to get me into the gym and feel like I was, you know, supposed to be there. Right. And not only that, but we're also men. Right. Yeah. And I could understand how it might be more intimidating for a woman because, well, I mean, men are intimidating, you know, they're loud and, and strong and, you know, they grunt or whatever. And you may feel like, you know, out of place or whatever. And this is true for men too. Um, and so now I'm much more empathetic. I totally get it because there are people that'll DM me and they'll say things like, I don't want to go to the gym. I don't, I'm, I, I'm intimidated by the gym. You know, what, what should I do type of deal? And so now I coach them differently. Now it's like, Hey, um, you could do exercises at home or you could get gym equipment at home, which in that case is extremely valuable because they've eliminated that such a big barrier. Yeah. Now they can work out at home. And you know when you work out at home, you don't you, you don't you can wear whatever you want. You can well, listen I, to whatever music you death want. Metal. Giving yourself a, a a little bit of you know having empathy for you because I was the same way too. That's that side or that uh, that side of the business has really evolved and changed. Like it wasn't. Oh yeah. When when that's we, a good point. You know it was Bowflex at no, home. Right. You know what I'm saying you had Bowflex or you had those adjustable dumbbell dumbbells was like or the plastic like sand filled weights is what we had. Yeah. Or you was, bought commercial equipment that took up which the no, whole garage and nobody yeah. did that. No. That was expensive and hard to do. So, you know, so it was it was a lot different then than what it is today. I mean, when you when you look at products like PRX that give you that an entire oh my god, you imagine I, if I had that when I was younger? Yeah, and then and then it, and it conveniently folds into the wall, so you can still park your gar garage yeah. or you can still use the the room if you're using it like an office, like. You just didn't have things like that when we first started as trainers. So no, no, even though even though you probably weren't being that empathetic, there's also that side too where, I, yeah. I mean, at that time, I didn't have a lot of clients that had a lot of success with any at-home type of setups because most of them were the generic gimmicky. Mm -hmm. In fact, you know, or the only ones people would invest in are the cardio equipment that would right. end up getting all the right. wardrobe and everything thrown on it. All which the infomercial stuff. Which yeah. actually, cardio equipment's a terrible... I, look, I mean, if you love it, that's fine. But for the most part, cardio equipment for home is a terrible investment because it's expensive. Does take up a decent amount of space, although some of them fold up too, like the like the treadmills. Yeah, but you're limited to what you can do on it. Not All to not to mention the, the the benefits that you get from it are no different than you going outside and walking up a hill either. Right, right, right. I right. mean, it's whereas weird. with you get you get good a good setup. Let's say you get a PRX cage, right? That folds into the wall, fold it out, boom. 
you now have access to, I don't know, 500 exercises that you could do yeah. with resistance training. Yeah. When I the first, best exercises. And when yeah. I first started lifting, because you make a really good point, Adam, when I was lifting at 14, my weight set was amazing uh, for the time. And all I had was an Olympic weight adjustable weight bench with barbell yeah. adjustable dumbbells. Just a bench, right? That's back, all I had too. Back in those days, getting a squat rack or cage for your house, yeah. y- you you had to go to a commercial producer yeah. at home cages. You couldn't even find them. And so I couldn't even do really barbell squats. I had to like make my own. I used the back of the bench and figured out a way to get the underneath the barbell. Now, and- do, you th- do you think this is another thing that, that- – CrossFit help do for the good, you know, like you think that the part of them popularizing, you know, barbell squats, it deadlifts, created another industry, right? Wow, and, I didn't and, even think and, the, and the kind of garage setup and stuff like that, like that's now become. I mean, how many people There's probably been a lot of innovation in that space? Think about it in the last yeah. decade, how many people probably you know signed up and enrolled in their first CrossFit class and went, oh shit, I could put this in my house. That's yeah. not a bad, that's not a bad right, like, point. That wasn't probably crossing a lot of people's mind. And again, nobody was squatting and deadlifting no, and overhead pressing. No. So I, I mean, they are probably responsible. I know we harp on them so much on this show, but you know, there's a, there's another thing that, that I, that I think they did really good for the space is You're that actually very true. That's, that's a, that's such a great point. The, uh, here's a more clear example. Cause I think that's a great example. He's an even more clear one. Bumper plates. You could not, you would never find a bumper plate in a gym ever before CrossFit. Oh, unless it was like a super specialized strength gym where they were training Olympic athletes. That's it. That's it. That's the only place you can get in, that. In fact, yeah. I never in my life lifted with a bumper plate ever until CrossFit got really popular. Yeah. And then you would start to see them pop up in gyms. All the weights I ever lifted with for the majority of the time I've worked out mm-hmm. were iron plates and to the point where iron plates were so popular and nobody was deadlifting ever that the most popular weight plate that you would use in a gym was a hexagon. Yeah. yeah. It wasn't round, and they did it so it wouldn't roll across no, the floor. No, you brought back memories. I remember uh, going on recruiting trips, and I got so excited because they took me in the weight room, and I saw bumper plates, and I saw platforms, and I was like, oh, my God, like, wow, this is this is like way next level. You know, like I was like getting all like bought into that whole thing just Dude, because of that. The first time I saw a platform, I went to a world's gym. Uh, this was probably in, the, I want to say, the late 90s, maybe maybe mid to late 90s. I drove all the way to a world's gym because I heard it was like a hardcore bodybuilder gym. So I want to take it, see what it was all about. And they had a separate room. It was a small room and it had a, uh, it didn't have a cage, but it had a stand. It had bumper plates and it had a platform. And that was the first time I'd ever seen chalk. Oh, first yeah. time I'd ever seen <laughs> bumper plates and a platform. And I didn't know what, what it was for. I'm like, what, what's the big yeah. deal? Just squat. What's the difference? If, I had no idea like what the big, you know, that big became deal a big sign. No chalk. You know, like, <laughs> yeah, every yeah, gym yeah. was like pissed about that. Yeah, yeah. it's crazy. Anyway, so, along the lines of exercise, uh, I read an, a phenomenal study. Um, again, really touting the benefits of exercise, but in a completely different way. So, what they did in this study is they compared uh, exercise to money. They compared exercise to money in terms of happiness. Which one brings people more emotional, mental value in terms of being content and happy with life? So Hmm. in this study, it was was 1.2 million people that they were doing this with, with, with surveys and whatever. Scientists found that while those who exercise regularly tended to feel bad for 35 days out of the year, uh, people who were, uh, who are not active were, felt bad for an additional 18 to 20 days a year. So the difference is pretty dramatic. People who work out, you're going to have bad days, right? People who don't work out, you have far more bad days. Now, okay, uh. did, did they separate the the class though? Like, so there's people that are making, you know, millions of dollars, but are working out. And then over here are people that maybe aren't making so much, very much money and they're working out. So did, there are other, they... there are other studies that show, and of course this varies from region to region, but generally speaking, and, I'm, and the reason why I'm saying region to region, because this I don't think would be true in, in San Jose. It's so expensive. But generally speaking, after about seventy-five to eighty thousand dollars a year, uh, people's uh, happiness scores uh, don't change. So once people make enough to kind of take care of themselves and not stress over things, anything over that doesn't provide any additional uh, happiness. Um, now, with with exercise, what they found there was a sweet spot, which I thought was fascinating because. We know uh, that you could overexercise, and then they'll probably have negative could, effects, right? You could be addicted to that, too. So what they found, according to the study, was that three to five training sessions a week that lasted 30 to 60 minutes was ideal. 
uh, the mental health of those participants who exercised for longer than three hours a day suffered more than those of those, than people who weren't even active. So people who overtrained or were obsessed had worse mental health than people who didn't even exercise at all. Mm. Just to show you how negative it could be if it's done the wrong way. I believe that. Isn't that mm -hmm. crazy? Yeah. Now yeah. you moved out of CrossFit, but I actually wanted to ask if either one of you guys read the article on the lawsuit. Yeah. Did you see that four million dollars? Four million dollars? awarded. Yeah. So explain this to me. So it was, they they were they they sued. Uh, was it NSCA? Or NSCA. Was it, yeah. Was it it's a national certification trainer uh -huh. certification? I think it was a counter very highly reputable, uh, you know, certification like scientifically based, all this kind of stuff. And I think they actually conducted their own. Uh, like studies and research on, you know, basically their methodology in CrossFit. And so then they, oh. they, they found a lot of flaws in their uh, research and stuff that they presented to um, basically, you know, bash CrossFit, you know, like on some level. And then th I think this was a really long, long uh, lawsuit. Like they've well, been had... Well, yeah, it, this was it was a it was this was a countersuit, right? Yeah. So, or was it a countersuit, or is it was it like for slander? Was it like slander? I think yeah. it was so, slander. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, NSCA came out and probably bashed CrossFit its methodology, right. and then CrossFit said, "Fuck you, we're gonna." Well, everybody, I mean, not everybody, I guess, obviously not NSCA uh, knows that uh, CrossFit is very litigious. Well, you want to hear what's funny though about this? Be, this is what the judge said in the ruling. I'm reading it right now. They yeah. said that NSCA's actions constituted extensive perjury and called them inherently untrustworthy. This was so That's apparently big. whatever evidence was presented showed it was sloppy. The NSCA wow. was un inherently untrustworthy. And what's crazy about this is as I'm reading further that the NSCA is already facing serious financial trouble. Mm -hmm. So now they've been slapped with a $4 million. So maybe that was them. They were just reaching, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that was probably like, okay, we're business is dying. We get, we're not getting any attention. Let's jump on the, let's pile on CrossFit bandwagon. Yeah. And I don't they, know how that all started. Didn't do it very intelligently. Dude, wow. I yeah. just know. Yeah. Obviously the, the, the information they presented was not good. The, the judge like totally slapped it out of the court. Well, that's a, that's a, that's a big settlement for a certification company. You know, $4 million is nothing. Is not nothing. Oh no! Especially that's, for a company, yeah, I wonder how struggling. they're going to use it, especially with their new direction. And I everything. mean, that could that could bankrupt a, a, a certificate. I mean, it'd be interesting for Doug to look this up. I mean, a trainer certification. And yeah, I mean, not, and NASM is, makes a lot of money, but the other ones, I don't they know. do. But even even them, though. I mean, uh, a lot of money goes into the people and, and studies and research, and uh, I don't know how much. I don't know if they're like a fucking massive mm. hundred million dollar company. Well, That'd be I'll, interesting. I'll to, say this about Glassman. Although I've had my issues with CrossFit itself. Um, Glassman is a fucking, I like him. I like what he stands for. I tend to like what he says when he's being interviewed. Well, I think like many things in the in the space that, um, even the things that we talk about that are bad, um, I think most stuff was intended to be good. I mean, there, there are some malicious people out there and there's people that are totally trying to manipulate and make money. Mm -hmm. But the things that really get big and, 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 and change industries, like we, we've spoken about that, I think the intention is pure and good. I, I, I think that, you know, it just it grew out of out of control. And when you set up something like a collective, like the way they have set up CrossFit, to where you have all they're not franchises that CrossFit's not responsible for how you know Joe trains in his mm -hmm. you know CrossFit box or whatever like that. You, you're you're setting yourself up for a lot of probably bad coaches. And he probably knew that he's a free market guy. Mm -hmm. Figured the cream will rise to the top. That and, was his approach. His yeah. approach was the the good ones will survive, their business will thrive, and the bad ones will fall apart. Now he's right. That's actually what's happened. You've seen the, the except then the good ones have not labeled themselves CrossFit anymore. Well, because you run this risk because they don't want to be associated with all the shitty ones like that, like wrap that label. That's on their, right. Their gym. That's right. What he failed to consider with that was that they were all under the brand umbrella mm -hmm. of CrossFit, and if you get enough people doing st stupid shit under in a brand name, then that name becomes tarnished. So then the good CrossFit gyms, the ones that are actually doing a good job with good coaches, they get to the point where they're like, we're going to do better off. We don't have to pay the fees or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll do better off. We've already built our, our our base. We'll do better off by changing our name, which is what's happened yeah. to a lot of them. So that was the thing that he failed to see. But he was right. The cream does rise to the top. But as a business person, uh, you, I, in my opinion, you need to, pra you need to, to put money and time and effort into protecting 
your name and who represents your name as much as possible because it doesn't take many uh, you bad, know, you know. I, I, I think I disagree with you. I think as a, as a person of integrity, I agree with you. But as a, as a business person, if we're just talking about making the most amount of money, I think he did it one of the smartest, best ways you could do it. You would have never scaled and grown that fast if you did it like a franchise. That That's would have, a good point. That would have slowed the growth of it down tremendously. Yeah, you've got I a mean, good point there. It's the same strategy that uh, the marijuana industry used. They, most of them are set up in, as collectives and they do that so they're not held responsible in a gray market for other people doing stupid things, making stupid claims, or but it allows them to spread and grow like crazy and profit. So that's not a bad point at all. Um, you know, maybe I, I guess you could have countered that by coming out publicly and saying things like, "If you do this, you're a bad gym." If you did, but I, yeah, you're right because there's no way they would have exploded. It yeah. would have been doing too much red tape, too much regulation, For sure, and and far less people would have uh, jumped on board because of the cost of. I, I of think I think he's an example, especially you of all people, because you're you're so pro free market. That he's an, a great example of that's how it works. And just like what Arthur Brooks, I don't know if you actually watched that monk debate that you sent over to us, but it was a phenomenal monk debate and. You know, part of part of free markets is you can't just put something out there and then judge it right away. You have to allow it to take totally. its process and and allow it to, you know, go through this this wave. Because as humans, we we wise up and we figure things out. Maybe everybody at first, oh, just we're a bunch yeah. of lemmings. No, hundred percent. But sooner or later, enough people fall off the cliff, and you go, okay, that's not a good thing to do. And well, then the market, yeah, naturally you just have corrects to get itself. louder voices in there to to regulate, you know, on their own, self regulate. Well, so. that's the market regulates better than anything. Have yeah. you seen, uh, like, if you look at uh, websites from ten years ago, compare them to today, you know, the internet is is largely unregulated. It's like an anarchy. It's like an anarcho-capitalist paradise, if you will. There's no regulations, very, very minimal ones, maybe the ones that that, that regulate the the wires that, you know, that send the internet to or whatever. But when you look on there and you see how, how fast and how efficiently and effectively it well, self-organized itself, it's insane. Black markets are the best example of this. Mm -hmm. Something that you would, you would think, right? Common sense would say, Oh my God! Buying drugs online from somebody you've never met across the world has to be the most dangerous thing ever. So far safer than it's the complete opposite. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, getting it from a friend who got it from a friend who hands it to you in person is far more dangerous than ordering something online, which which has all these self regulators of uh, people that are writing reviews and man. And have um, you seen the studies on that? That the 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 uh, drug overdoses are down. You know, uh, poisonings are way down because people are buying their drugs online and then they're reading the they're reviews it. Yeah. of the dealers. <laughs> right. To the point where I've actually talked to people who've done this, and they're saying if your dealer sends you, you know, you order something yeah. and they send it to you and it doesn't get come in the mail, they will send you another batch. To make sure that you give them a good review, and I'm like, what the fuck kind of drug dealers <laughs> That's are they? I bought from Spider, and I almost died. One hundred percent. It's wild. One hundred percent. No, it's it's it is very wild. That's why too, I was always big on the Bitcoin thing. Now I know fucking anybody who bought Bitcoin back when I was talking about it is probably not oh, very, did you read there was very rich. There right was now, actually <laughs> an, there was actually an article about uh, cryptocurrencies. I forgot who did the review, but it was a big organization. I can't remember what economic uh, organization that did this, but they did a big review. And they said that at some point in the near future, relatively near, that all currencies it are has to crypto. go. It has yeah. to go. Even when you like mm. that again, referring back to that monk debate, uh, you when you have all these economists that are talking about whether it be you know socialist or a capitalist type of market in the future, none of them are debating whether or not cryptocurrency is the future of how we're going to exchange monies. Mm. I mean, it's it is the future, and and things like the the black market to me was an example of. Whether it goes and uh, whether government gets their hands in it, tries to regulate it or not, it will survive purely for that in itself because of what you just said yeah. is that you can trust the the internet to provide you illegal things better than you can somebody mm -hmm. you know in person. That's crazy. Yeah, no, I'll, crazy. I'll show you one of the articles right here that I read that it said that uh, one. So there's one one organization that's uh, one organization said that all cryptocurrencies uh, or all currencies will become cryptocurrencies at some point. That's the CEO of a Goldman Sachs backed startup company. And there's other um, there's other organizations that are saying the same exact thing. So it's like it's a matter of time. Now now what that, I, that's how everything now is. Now what I think is going to happen now. So uh, uh, my thoughts on this have slightly changed, right? Like before I you know I researched and picked like I think I, I have like seven different companies that I have money right in. And not a lot. It was I looked at it as gambling and then I just put it away. 
But what what's more likely to happen to me now are like your big mega companies, uh, the Apples, the Googles, the Facebook. They will come out with their own crypto and build it within their ecosystem. Mm. That makes the most sense to me on what will what will happen. And you know that's happened. Right? Facebook's already said they're moving mm -hmm. in that direction in the future. And so if you're already using a company, all their resources and stuff, like Amazon, for example, like it would be like last night, I'm shopping, Christmas shopping all over Amazon. You know, if I had Amazon cryptocurrency already, boy, the whole process would be even faster. I mean, mm -hmm. it's definitely much quicker today with things like Apple Pay and PayPal and but I mean, if it was crypt Amazon's crypto and I use, I buy everything on Amazon anyways, it'll be super fast, so super safe. The, so here's some speculations for me that I would say that the the future, if that is the case, because mm. one of the one of the downsides of cryptocurrencies from a government standpoint is that you can't, can't control it. you can't track them, right? You can't track them, you can't inflate them, you can't just cr create money out of thin air. One of the other challenges is taxing. How do you tax a currency that you can't? necessarily track pinpoint yeah. right but yeah. i think what'll end up happening is that the tax system is going to yeah, become all sales tax isn't that already kind of mm -hmm. happening in, on a smaller scale now with cash y yeah with cash with uh you know uh what's the, you know paypal's venmo's uh you know cash friend or what to I mean, some extent but right, those, those are far hard, far easier to track right well i don't know about far but they're easier to track for sure but i mean how how with millions of people using those things yeah how how easy is that for someone to you would have to be you would to me you or I mean, you would have to be somebody who would throw up a red flag for them to really dive into all that stuff. Well, they're, right? They're, they're looking at the big money, the right, big money, numbers, right? So there's, yeah. which is a, yeah, you're not getting, which, which you're is not a one percent of the population. Yeah, the right? IRS yeah. is not taking you know Mrs. Johnson who makes forty grand a year and has three kids. That's my point. Yeah, and she she she, she made a hundred and twenty five dollars in Venmo this last yeah. year, two fifty in PayPal over here. Yeah, you know no, what I'm saying? No. And Cash App, she got another seventy five dollars. Yeah. That's like, what that's what uh, that's yeah. why I think the future of taxing will probably be a sales tax because that's the easiest way to control it. if you're selling something you got to charge a tax on it mm -hmm. no more income tax it's going to be pure consumption tax you know the, what was interesting arthur brooks uh, proposed something i'd never heard before what was it called negative you know? income tax yeah yeah I, that's I, a, that's I, a I, milton friedman came up with that concept and basically what it is is that you it, once you make us you, you do get money from the government if you make a, a certain below a certain amount so that's the way that he would take care of that other than that it's more of a flat tax uh where you know everybody else may you know pays you know 10 Fifteen percent, no matter what, no, yeah. no write-offs, nothing. Which would be brilliant. Obviously, I it know. would be brilliant because <laughs> it, it would eliminate tremendous bureaucracy. Which is exactly why it would never happen because you'd right. have a lot of people out of business. If all of a sudden it would be as easy as you, how much did I make? Pay fifteen percent, done. Right. No write-offs, nothing. Taking the jobs from people that just move your shit around. Oh my god, dude! Come how, on, how dude. confusing? Get rid of these people. How confusing <laughs> is the tax system? Let's be honest. Oh, it's the worst. <laughs> you need man. you need brilliant people to figure that thing out. <laughs> oh, with lots yeah. of education. Hey, was it you? It was, I don't know if it was Justin or you yesterday uh, brought up something about um, Fitbit. I got it. Oh, yeah, yeah, it was oh, you. Oh, dude, did you hear this? No, I didn't. I wanted. So to, one I'm of the this curious, is though. this is one of the drawbacks apparently. A Fitbit, which you know, Fitbit's got an interesting. It's got its value, right? Uh, well, now it got acquired by Google now, so it's got a big, you know, back end support for sure. Yeah, so it's got it's got some you know interest, right? It's got some interesting stuff, right? It. it it, it, what did it, they sell to Google, by the way? I don't know. Oh, Tell, can you look it, it up? Like what, what four it? billion or something? Really? I think if I, this is just literally like off the top of my head. Wow, man! And you know, I I was in conversation. They started out of San Francisco uh, when I first started boot camps. Way back, and I remember when it hit the market. I was so impressed with it, and I was in conversation with them. Now I was nobody. I had no pool or anything like that. So I, yeah. it was kind of like I got left. You know, yeah, we'll get around to you, kid. Yeah. But I think back, like, man, I wish Mind Pump was where it was at when I that know. came on the market. I think about I that too, especially like the transition from Body Bug to you know Fitbit. It was like, wow, it's it's very similar technology, but now it's actually smaller and like something people will actually wear. Oh, Justin, right. it says it's considering a sell. Oh, it didn't actually go through yet. Well, that's September. I don't 20th. think so. It hasn't gone through yet. Okay. Now, is it? Does it say what they're what, what they're nego how much they're negotiating, Doug? I don't see it. Let me look more. So they haven't officially sold. It's just they've been taught. Oh, two. There it is. Oh, two point one billion. Okay. So I was Google two to acquire uh, valuing smartwatch maker two point one billion. Wow. So now that does it say they did it or they're just they're. 
I thought talking about I it. I thought Doug. I read in click Forbes. On that, wait, wait, no, click was, on that article. Well, it looks like the Justice Department is reviewing this first before the deal goes. Oh, for, oh, oh monopoly oh, reasons. Right, well, whatever. no, probably no. I don't think so. Or I think for it's, data. Yeah, data. Yeah, because now they're tracking. Uh, like, I mean, I mean, imagine that they can track your heart no, that's rate. Health data. I my opinion with that is that Google's going to advertise to you or whatever, and they're going to look at your heart rate. Yeah. They're going to see what gets you excited, what doesn't. Well, oh, that's that could be uh, potentially could be brilliant. Data, but you guys ever follow Rock Health or they're they're basically out of San Francisco. They do events and stuff, but they try and pull in all the startups for digital health, you know, initiatives. Uh And so it's it. I've been kind of watching it and seeing what that market looks like, you know, over the years, uh, because like they're trying so hard to innovate, you know, processes where you can you can have these like virtual. Uh, you know, meetings with with physicians, and then like transfer all of your records and everything digitally. There's just a lot of red tape there because you know, obviously, that's really uh, this you know, disruptive. Yeah, disruptive. Wow, that's cool. But yeah, they're working really hard on like all kinds of different angles. I, I love that. I love the yeah. future of that. Uh, but it, well, so here's the thing on Fitbit that I was going to bring up. Here's one of the drawbacks. Yeah, so sorry, apparently, I, totally, totally yeah, <laughs> I just well, you made the comment. Sorry, Sal. So no, no, no worries. So uh, so apparently, so I don't know if you knew this or not, but if you you, you can have other people can monitor your Fitbit if you allow them to, kind of like tracking your, you know, yeah, like, yeah. That's so been around for, for a while. like accountability. Coaches, yeah. they have it for coaches, right, right, right. Yeah. So like you know, on your cell phone, if you want, your girlfriend can see where you're at or whatever. So anyway, this guy, <clears throat> apparently this guy, his girlfriend had access to his Fitbit, and uh, he was out, you know, out of town with his buddies. And she noticed his heart rate was spiking at 3 a.m. Oh, my God. Shut your face. She caught him cheating because of the Fitbit. Shut your face. <laughs> yeah, dude. Are you serious? Yeah. So she's like, One hey. One o'clock? Is you like, doing jumping jacks? Hey, what were you doing last night? Like, oh, I went to bed at, at uh, you know 11 p.m. Really? Did you wake up? No. Really? Because your heart rate hit 135 yeah, at fucking 3 a.m. I said to go for a run. Yeah. Uh, that's really weird because at 3 a.m. I saw your yeah. heart rate hit 125 beats wow. per minute. Wow. <laughs> he serious? couldn't come up with where any excuse. Where did you find that article, on, man? That was posted well, yeah, what are you going to tell me of serious bout of fucking diarrhea <laughs> like what one thir- something dude. 135 got you know it's even worse it's like i had a nightmare he couldn't even yeah. ar- he couldn't even argue his way out because she's got all the past data too she'd be like listen motherfucker uh, your you trends get- say otherwise yeah, when you get yeah. up and go pee you go from 52 to yeah. 63 at most you yeah. know what i'm saying 135 you did some shit dude yeah. he got caught you're doing wow. rigorous How- activities where did you see that i was it was posted everywhere you look up wow. girl catches boyfriend dude, that's eating. hilarious yeah with, does uh, someone with- dm or share that with you no i just uh yeah some Somebody did share it with me. I love like our audience. I love our audience. Isn't By the way, yeah. I appreciate that when people share great stuff like oh, that. Oh, dude, That's I get hilarious. all my... Oh, I had one. That, this is a funny one that I kind of put you know, towards the end. But this was like uh, in... In relation to the latest post that, you know, we had like little like clips of us doing stuff like off camera and like, I you know, my fart and all that kind of stuff. So there's this guy in Uganda. <laughs> every, day, every day. Yeah. There's this guy in Uganda, I guess, has deadly gas that, that will kill mosquitoes. And they're what? they're they're hiring him to like you know m- like figure out the the chemical combination that he's producing because like like everywhere that he is apparently like there's no mosquitoes. Wait a minute, how the hell? It this- sounds like bullshit, but it, I, I looked back and there's all these articles. Yeah, about but how it. it's did hilarious. This, how did this even start? Was he just with hanging out with someone like man? <laughs> <laughs> Your fucking farts would kill. You're so, they're so bad that they kill like insects. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Oh wow, look at that. Jo- uh, Joe Marara, R- R- whatever his name is. He's making huge cash. It's said to be making huge cash from his unique and deadly farts that kill mosquitoes instantly. Instantly. Wow. Like, did you catch What video? a superpower. Did you get some videos? It, it, it was on YouTube. Yeah, there's like a video of him, you know, describing it. But yeah, like it's funny because like the locals, you know, villagers and like the barber there is like talking all about like, yeah, you know, he can he can clear like a couple miles. Wow, with his six, gas. His far- six meters is far, bro. Yeah, so he can kill mosquitoes up to six meters. Six away. meters, six meters away. Yeah. That, I mean, that's you're, you're further than that, or you're closer than that right now. That's yeah. a long ways away, bro. Could you? There's have- lots of like legend and folklore around him now. I, I can't, I yeah. can't imagine. First of all, I think it's bullshit. But let's say it's I true. know totally. <laughs> Let's say it's real. It's hilarious. This though. sounds like a terrible, uh, you know, uh, thing that they're going to create from this. Can you imagine <laughs> right. they spray oh, this around yeah. the city. Just yeah, yeah. a big fart. A yeah. new Febreze Brrr. smell. Yeah. A new yeah. Febreze. I feel like ju- I feel like Justin. You've got some money just sitting there. You know, you know what I mean. <laughs> There's something there. <laughs> you're 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 missing out. Yeah, yeah. I am. Paying. Anyway, so I read one of the most crazy articles ever the other day, and it's and I'm, I want to make sure that it's real, and I've tried to re- look up you know the references or whatever. Only thing I've ever been able to find so far are other articles reporting the same thing. So I can't 100% confirm this, 
but apparently it's plausible. Okay, I mean, it's that doesn't mean it's likely, but it's plausible. So check this out, right? Chris Long, I'm going to read part of this article. Chris Long is an IT worker uh, in Reno, Nevada. All of his DNA in his semen belongs to a German man he's never met. So in his semen, he's got the DNA from another man. And this is because he had a bone marrow transplant a while ago to cure his, he had a type of cancer that needs a bone marrow transplant. And what ended up happening is now this, the man whose bone marrow he got, that's the DNA in his semen. And the reason why this is a big deal is because, so I was reading this article, scientists are like tripping out over this. They thought this wasn't possible, but apparently this is the deal. And they're wondering how, how many people this has happened to. Now imagine a crime scene. Oh my God. Imagine a crime scene where your DNA, which is considered to be conclusive evidence, because you gave some dude your bone marrow. Yeah. Now your DNA is found in some murder or rape victim or whatever. And you're like, what the fuck? That wasn't me. And they're like, we got your DNA. Your ass is going that to That can't be true. How does that's that make what, it into the semen? Well, and so- how, Yeah, that would, means it would completely have to alter his blood. Well, so, completely, uh, so, they, so it's not, uh, an, it's, this part is known that, that will, you will have some DNA present in your blood from the person who donated the bone marrow. We've known that. But the fact that it made it to his semen yeah. is, is crazy. Well, is that true too then with like organs? I don't know. I don't think so. No, you I don't think so. Well, either way, that's that's a trip. Why like, wouldn't it? How? Be? Yeah. Why? Why? Why would? Why wouldn't organs do it? But bone would. I don't know, dude. Tell me that wouldn't be a freaking awesome oh episode of CSI. This is like Black Mirror. Dude. <laughs> yeah. It's probably already got <laughs> one. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I was the whole time you were telling that. I'm like looking at it you. It wasn't me waiting yeah. for the punchline. Like yeah, it was yeah. I got you type of. But tell me that wouldn't be a rad episode. You know what I mean? We're like this is weird. His DNA was there, but he's clearly you know the man died four years ago. How is this possible? <laughs> Fascinating. Or some shit like that. <laughs> anyway, dude, I I. I Listen to more of the Rogan uh, episode debate with Will oh, on the yeah, la- on the last one, not to. Huh? I finished it too. So. so here's here. This is so there were definitely a few points that uh, Wilkes made, yeah. but the points that he made, you don't were, know how to read a force plot. Yeah, like, what he hammered the hell out of that. All he did, and and this is what Wilkes. This is my theory. My theory is that Dave Cameron, Arnold Schwarzenegger, who produced Game Changers, a lot of money, a lot of power, hired political strategists mm-hmm. to train. Wilkes on debating. Yeah. Because what Wilkes did very well was reframe the argument mm-hmm. and attack Chris Kresser's uh, character. He did a shitty job actually disputing the points. Yeah. There, there was, who's, who's he danced Dave, around who's the Dave points. Dave Cameron. Uh, oh, no. Dave, uh, James Cameron. Uh, James oh, Cameron. Sorry. I was like, who's, who's yeah, Dave? James Cameron. You know, Dave? Yeah, who's he Dave? did uh, Avatar and well, all those other things. Yeah, who's yeah. Dave? Dave. Well, <laughs> yeah. I call him. I get what you When I him get... and I text each other, that's what I call him. <laughs> <laughs> We're friends. But anyway. <laughs> but what they, what, Love the Terminator, Dave. But he clearly, <laughs> what, what he did, and this is a very effective strategy that pol- politicians do, is rather than debating the point, which they may know is not the, the right point, like if I'm debating with you and I know that I'm wrong, mm-hmm. what I'm going to do is reframe the whole argument, and that's yep. exactly what he did. So rather than defending the points of the movie that say that meat is bad for you, which is that's the argument, the yeah. argument that Chris, we, we never got there, we never got a conclusive answer. No, to what, what Chris three and a half hours, and you couldn't get to no, that. No, no, oh my god, all that's he did was so frustrating all about he, it. All he did was attack Cresser's character and then focus on small nuances to make Cresser appear to be yeah. All your wrong. sources are bullshit. Meanwhile, I'm doing the same thing by having a biased cherry picking data, you know, experience yeah. myself. Well, yeah, yeah. we we've had, I don't know, what, 500 maybe more guests on this show. I would say Chris K- Cresser is in the top 3 of like the softest spoken yeah. of all of well, them. Well, what Cresser like, did- he is not the right guy to go have a, a well, he debate. W- he is if they debated the points. Cresser is extremely it, it, knowledgeable. It, come on. What but, does that ever happen in you're a right. debate? No, you're he's knowledgeable and he, he he has great you know wealth of knowledge, but at the same time, as far as debating goes, yeah, yeah I would much have preferred to have like Elaine Norton or somebody Lane, in there. Elaine, Sean, I mean- Saladino. Yeah, Saladino. Yeah, Saladino. Exactly. There's so many other people that would have probably gone. So you know who the second person that would be terrible would be? Uh, um, uh, our keto friend. I can't think of his name right now. Dr. Um, Dom D'Agostino. Yeah, Dom. Dom and Chris, probably the two yeah. softest poking <laughs> doctors we've had on the show. Right. And I'll, I would never put them in that situation. Yeah, again. Like, and not because they're not intelligent enough to defend a point. It's just, that's not, they're not guys. Yeah, it's that politics, do. like you said. It wasn't Sal. the point. The, the, the point wasn't focused. The, the, what Cresser should have done is continue to reframe this to say, hold on a second. What you said is that meat is bad. Let's focus on that. Right. Show me why meat is Let's bad. Let's stay there. 
there. Because he, he wouldn't allow it to happen. He kept yeah. reframing the argument, attacking Kresser's character, yeah. which is a, a classic political strategy. But he didn't win shit in terms no. of... He didn't defend the points at all. And there was one part on Rogan that got me a little upset. And it was because, again, they were arguing the wrong thing. So it was, it was around dairy. And what yeah. Kresser showed is that the evidence in the study... Studies show that consuming dairy regularly does not increase inflammation in the body. In fact... Uh, in, in many studies, it shows a decrease in inflammation. Now, what Wilkes brought up is that how can that be true when two-thirds of the population Are is, is lactose intolerant? Yeah. And, and you, know, you guys know as well as I do, when you consume something that you're intolerant to, that's going to increase inflammation. Now, that sounds like a very smart point. The problem is when we're looking at the studies about people who consume dairy, that's, that's already been selected out. People who consume dairy on a regular basis are not people who have intolerances to dairy or have a lactose intolerance. Largely, these mm -hmm. are people that tolerate dairy. So when you do a study on people that consume dairy for the last 10 years, yeah. you're probably looking at a bunch of people who don't have- They have blatant, no problem with it. They have no blatant, like, you know what I mean? Like, you're, I'm not going to be in that study. If they tried to have me in that study, I'd say, well, I don't consume dairy. I know I have an intolerance to it. Right. So it's not that, that it doesn't cause inflammation in people who are intolerant. It's that the people that can tolerate it Studies show, and this I've argued this all day long. If you can tolerate dairy, it's and if it's well sourced, it's fucking good for you. Mm -hmm. It's very good for you. If you can't tolerate, don't eat it. Just like you, you shouldn't eat anything. You're not, and that's the problem. Like if if I was debating Wilkes, I would have shit on that point right there. But the problem was he made that point, and then Kresser not to went mention to if, it, if you're if we're if you're measuring all the people that actually have dairy, how many how many of those average Americans probably overconsume, and that's causing just as much inflammation right, but, as anything else. But, like, but, but you're, again, you're the eating study, a fucking. I was that guy. I was that yeah, kid. You're yeah. eating a pint of ice cream every single night. Like yeah, yeah. I'm sure I had all kinds of inflammation present in my body. Yep. And it wasn't until it became so so much of a problem that I was intolerant to it. Now I have to stop doing right, it. Right, so, right, right, right. But again, I'm I would bet um, money. That James Cramen, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Schwarzenegger, who's been in politics for a long time, they probably invested in a very smart political, someone who's got experience in the political sphere, and they said, here's the first episode with Kresser debating his points. Let's who, construct yeah, and they just who, combed through let's it. Let's frame an argument that'll yeah, that'll yeah. discredit him so that we can defend Which, our documentary. I mean, he did a great job in his delivery of what he set out to do. Who, That's right. Who is James taken away from him? He's a he's a he's, he was an MMA, MMA fighter. Coach. He produced the the documentary or was part oh, he was of the guy movie. in the documentary. He was the, he came on and whooped fucking Chris. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I'm dude, I'm telling you if, I didn't know that. If you if you're debating someone and you it was control, the argument, the way if, that he didn't framed it. Look, if you control the framing of the argument, you can win a debate even though you're wrong. And and people have known this for a long time. And that's the problem. The problem was it wasn't – I would have kept bringing it back. Hold on a second. Okay, I, that's great. But you're saying in the documentary that meat is bad. So let's look at that evidence uh, that shows that well, meat is bad. Yeah, I tell you what. Chris is a boy of ours. Love everything that he does. But shame on you, dude. Should have stayed in your lane. Mm, Shouldn't well, have stepped in that arena. You should have known better. Like you, I mean – Somebody like that, you 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 don't put yourself in that situation. Oh, I don't think this is the last. I don't think this is the last we've heard. Oh, no. you think that he'll? You think he'll rebuttal it? Yeah, I think so because I think now he's had time to to sit back and say, "Wow, I know exactly." I what wonder. Happened. Yeah, I wonder if Chris went in there just thinking he was going to mop him up because he was just some MMA fighter and he probably knew that he he probably thought that he had more research. Bro, let me let me put it this way: If you have an economist debating a politician on the economy, the politician's going to win. Yeah. Even though the politician probably knows jack shit about economics. And it's all because they're going to pull at emotion. They're going to discredit the the person. They're going to reframe the argument. You got someone like Bernie Sanders, for God's sakes. I don't want to get all political. But this guy's arguing economics, and he's wrong on almost everything that he says. But he's a good politician, and it sounds pretty damn good. And so that's why he wins a lot of votes. Wow. So that's the problem. First question is from DSA Inc. 213. What are the differences between a front and behind the head overhead press? Is one more beneficial than the other? Okay, so they both have unique benefits, but before we get into those... One uh, is more risky. Yeah, way more. So a, a front, a traditional front uh, overhead press where the bar is in front of your, in front of your head is far less risky 
than a behind the head uh, over overhead press. A behind well, the head overhead press well, requires a lot of good mobility. I was going to say you have to explain it. It wouldn't be if we all had healthy posture. Yeah, right. If, if you yeah. is not if, the case. Yeah, if, I mean, if uh, and that's why we weren't taught it in any of our certifications. Like if yeah. every national cert that I have, uh, every single one of them, none of them advocate. Oh, they for, avoid it. Like the yeah, plague. it's a it's a do not do type of deal. Um, and so that's why I didn't I didn't teach it and I didn't do it myself for many years, which actually. Uh, probably did more harm than good for me, mm-hmm. and and the truth is, if if it hurts you or it, you, you can't do it with good form, don't do it. Yeah, until don't you can. don't do it till you can. But that's a great sign that you there's an area you need to work on. Totally, and it's yeah. it's the lack of shoulder mobility and probably thoracic mobility that is that is limiting you from being able to do that, which is an obvious thing since I think the percentage is somewhere between, uh, I want to say 65 and 80% of the population suffers from upper cross syndrome. Mm -hmm. So if a majority of the population have the rounded shoulders and the forward head, well, yeah, trying to take a bar behind your head. Without jutting your head forward and and externally rotating your shoulders. Yeah, but if you you can do it, it's going to promote, Good shoulder mobility and thoracic mobility. So totally. The, so it's it's kind of like the uh, the think of it the same way of like uh, de- doing a deep squat. Most people shouldn't do an ass to grass squat because they don't have the capabilities to do it because mm-hmm. their form is going to break down. They're going to feel it in their low back. They're going to fall way forward. But that's a, a sign that you should work on that. So I'm the, I was this person. Now what's cool now that I've done all the work of working on my mobility for a solid year and a half or so. To get into a deep squat, now the only thing I need to do to keep mobility in my ankles and my hips is deep squat. Right, right, That's right. what's awesome is that, so if you can't do behind the neck presses right now, the real benefits of being able to do them is it promotes good shoulder and thoracic mobility, and that's an excellent thing. No, totally. Now, an overhead press is hard to do for the average person anyway. Right. It still requires work and mobility, and, and you right. take that behind the neck, and you've just you know, exponentially made the exercise far more difficult. Now, that all being said, just like Adam said, if you can do them properly, if you have good control, good stability, I love behind-the-neck presses. It, it's a completely different type of form. I feel it in different parts of my shoulder. I go lighter. Because of the position that I'm maintaining, the pumps I get in my shoulder are phenomenal. I feel like I get less of the front part of my shoulder and a little more of the side of my shoulder when I'm pressing up, mainly because of the position that I'm trying to hold myself in. Mm -hmm. It was a favorite among bodybuilders back in the day. Back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, bodybuilders favored behind the neck press over for over uh, you know traditional overhead press. The overhead press didn't get popular in bodybuilding. It, well, it was popular in, originally in the you know 40s and 50s, maybe 60s. It didn't get popular again until relatively recently because you had bodybuilders like, you know, Jay Cutler who did standing overhead presses and of course whatever the top guy does, everybody else does. But for a long time it was all about behind the neck presses, behind the neck pull downs. You see Arnold Schwarzenegger and Franco Colombo doing them like crazy. I love them. I have to go much lighter. Mm -hmm. So if I do an overhead press, I'm going to go – the lightest I'll go with a barbell is 100 pounds. I'll go as heavy as 130 to 140 pounds. When I'm behind the neck, I go 50, 60 pounds, and maybe 100 pounds at the absolute heaviest. Yeah, I would definitely put that as an advanced – you know, exercise to where it is something that, you know, is achievable and attainable and it does provide, you know, value. Like it definitely promotes, uh, you know, a different stimulus for your muscles to respond to. And, and it's, it it does, you know, help your, your shoulders build, you know, in a different way, but it's going to require a lot of work, a lot of prerequisites to even get close to be able to, to to be able to have access and also to control it properly. This is why I love the Z press. Z press. I good fell start. in love with this exercise for this exact reason. It was around the time that I was working on this. Yeah, because when you first, it wasn't that long ago you first you started you started doing behind the neck presses. Right, because I couldn't. I, I like like many people, I couldn't I couldn't take the bar behind the back of my head without you know forcing my head forward. And what I loved about that now some of the obviously the prerequisites that Justin's talking about, you know, your wall circles, your thread right. the needle, your uh, even doing the PVC pipe, right? Your th- uh, your um, your uh, handcuff to rotation. These are all great mobility exercises to do to start with uh, getting your, your in the right position. Then the exercise that I love to do to help me get to a place where I can do behind the neck presses is the Z press, and the two main reasons why that one. 
uh, when you're in the Z press position and you and you press, which for those that don't know what that is, it's when you're and I like to do it inside the squat rack where I'm sitting on my butt and I use the and your uh, legs are straight out. Yeah, my legs are straight out and I use the guards on uh, the squat rack like you would for safety guards to start the bar on there to where it's resting by my chest and then you press up above your head, pull your head through the window and the the key to this is the the stabilization at the top. So I when I'm teaching this to a client um, that I'm working on this with is we'll start really light and we start in the Z press, we press and completely extend all the way up and stabilize up there. That that stabilization with the bar completely extended above your head, your head pulled uh, through through the window, we say. like And that right there is a great place yeah. to start. This is also why, you know, I, I would do those like, like one arm carries and stabilizing mm -hmm. like weight overhead carries. Uh, and then also, you know, because you need to learn that, that mechanism, that mechanism on packing the shoulder. So not just reaching out, but you have to anchor that too with your, with your shoulder blade. And so to be able to stabilize properly in your full lockout, being able to control the load, be able to decelerate it properly, bring it down nice and slow. And, and you know, all these things involved, it, it takes some time and effort, but you definitely can build your way towards a nice solid, you know, behind the neck press. Well, yeah, and you, the, and the beauty of the Z press is that you can't cheat it and that's why i like it better than single arm exercises or machine or anything else that you're trying it's 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 great for teaching it's almost cheap proof it, it is yeah. because it, it in order for you to stay upright yeah, fall back and or fully extend and to where the bar is above above almost or behind your head and your arms in line with your ears that's the, the only way it works without you falling backwards. If you press and extend all the way and you're the type of person who arches the back and uses your chest to leverage up and you can't pull your shoulder blades back like Justin's saying, you will fall backwards. Mm -hmm. And so it's a great way to to teach those good mechanics. It's a, I, I, these are, here's, here's, this is like to Sal's big argument on Instagram the last few days about, you know, here's a, here's a good example of like, this is where coaching comes into play for a really long time. Like if you were to do, uh, show somebody uh, the research on, you know, a Z press compared to a standing overhead press, which builds the most muscle in your shoulders, like Z press is going to lose. It's not a better movement in comparison to a standing overhead press where I can generate more force and I have and I have more. Yeah, but its value is not in building muscle in comparison to a exactly. Yeah. And so the, the, you know that's just something that you've learned from years of coaching people and knowing that trying that application to, of it right, getting clients to cue cue them the correct way to to do the movement properly. It's one of those little trainer yeah. tricks. You know I who love. you know who does uh, a version of that exercise that I've seen uh, done over and over again is uh, of that is uh, Olympic lifters. You ever seen Olympic lifters? Mm -hmm. They'll put the it's bar like across press. their traps. Yeah. yeah, like they finish this, like they're squatting, and then they pop and they press yep. it up and bring it back that's down. A, the that's traps. a move. What is that called, Justin? That's a yeah. move, isn't it? Yeah, like, uh, I mean, it's pretty much just like a push press, but it's like, but from it's the, off the, behind the neck. Yeah. And it's in a seated position. No, no, they, no standing. No, standing. It's oh. explosive. Yep. Oh, you're yeah. saying if standing. Yeah, because, you know, when you're Olympic lifting, they have to be so good at, at at lining their body up straight up above their head with maximum weight. Yeah. They can't be forward an inch or back an inch or they're going to lose the, the lift. So that's one of their lifts. I've seen, I saw a video on YouTube of Mario Pujanowski. He was a uh, mm. world's strongest man doing yeah. that with like 300 pounds. Yeah. Um, and that encouraged me to do a full range of motion behind the neck press. When you get really good mobility and control, bring the bar all the way down to your traps and press all the way up. The pump you get from that. Right. It, but again, you got to do it right, otherwise you're going to hurt yourself. But the pump you get from that is insane. It's one of the number one exercises that will give me the best shoulder pump by far. Next question is from Jessa007. Why do lifters arch their back during a bench press? Is it actually safer? Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. You know what's funny? So do you, you know if you're listening to the podcast right now, try this out, right? Lay down on the floor. And what you're going to know, just, just lay down flat on your back and relax. What you'll notice is that there's going to be a natural arch in your low back. There may even be a little bit of a space to where you can slide some fingers under your low back and your butt is on the floor and your back or maybe your upper back is on the floor. So you have that natural arch. It's more of a natural position, number one. Number two, the arch in the back. And by the way, this doesn't mean you lift your butt up off the bench. That's no. cheating. That's not the same. No, you anchor and, your butt. And down. I'm not talking about the extreme forms of this. There are people that can that do this to such a ridiculous extent uh, that they limit their range of motion, maximize how much weight they can lift, and it's a technique. Yeah, they lift maybe an inch. Yeah, no, I'm talking about just a, a normal, normal, you know, tight, natural curvature in the lower back where your shoulders are pinned back. 
that allows that puts your shoulder joint in a much more favorable position mm -hmm. for you to press. It reduces the risk of shoulder impingement and issues with the bicep tendon. Gives you allows you to have more of a full range of motion with your press. It's just a safer. Yeah, it helps you distribute for, that load more effectively. That's right. That's it, right. It's it's a must. Uh, if you're if you're it was a mistake as a trainer that I used to teach. Um, you know, I I remember the first time I'd seen this again. You know, a young trainer seeing a, a power lifter lift for the first time, not understanding the physics behind it, why they're doing it, not even being great at the mechanics. But ha here I have the all these national certifications, and they they you know don't condone it, and so it's mm -hmm. all about safety and teaching a client to arch their low back is could be dangerous. So we I went the complete opposite and would teach clients to flatten their back and put their feet up on the bench, oh, yeah. which, is, which is just an awful idea because so, so unstable. The, the point that you made. If you lay down flat, if you lay on the ground flat, your head flat, your back's flat, and, or and your butt's on the ground, everybody will have, uh, you'll be able to at least fit fingers. Some people will even be able to fit their hand or arm underneath mm -hmm. there. You'll have that much of a, a natural arch. And that is you just laying there. If you then take your shoulders and retract and depress, which is where they're supposed to be when you start a bench press, it's very important that you're in that position, it'll excessively arch it. Yeah. You'll definitely be able to fit your arm underneath that. So... It's it's necessary that you have an arch in there. It's it's what you don't want is you don't want, it doesn't need to be excessive unless you're a power lifter and looking for every bit of leverage, mm -hmm. you know, then then you don't want well, it. Well, and we're also looking at vertical and horizontal, you know, force vectors. Like like where's most of the force coming from? It's 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 directed vertically is where you got to be worried. Like if I was standing up and I had like an excessive True. back arch, like that's a problem. That's you know, a good that point. I'm susceptible to, you know, that force being directed to its weakest point. And so for here, the weakest point is, you know, right behind the shoulders. And so if I'm like bringing my shoulder blades together now i'm more supportive ah, right? what a great what an excellent point justin so essentially uh to to put it in even more of layman's terms right if you're standing up and you have a weight on your shoulders or above your head the weight is pushing down on your body and you're supporting yourself from the standing position arching your back really strongly very dangerous it's gonna it, it, yeah it, it's you might hurt yourself now when you're on a bench the weight is pressing down on your arms and your arms are connected to your shoulders and your shoulders are resting on the bench if you flatten your back, what you actually run the risk of doing is taking your shoulders off the bench a little bit and actually losing stability. Mm -hmm. Arching your back, all it does is connect the bar to the bench. It actually makes it far safer. What a brilliant uh, point to bring up, Justin. Next question is from Natalie Getz. What are the pros and cons of supersetting? Super setting. So super setting is, uh, is, I think there's a few different definitions, but the traditional definition of a superset is taking two exercises, just two, and doing one after the other one without any rest. Um, now, some of the benefits of doing that, well, it depends how you combine exercises. If you're combining exercises that work different parts of your body, uh, a lot of the benefits tend to be more of a stamina and endurance type of benefit, um, and it tends to be a little bit more, local, more uh, generalized, I would say, for the whole body. If you superset for the same body part, like I say, let's say I do one chest ex exercise and then I go to another chest exercise mm. uh, very quickly, I get endurance more locally in the chest. But the reason why you see people supersetting typically with weights is because of the pump. Mm -hmm. yeah. the, 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 the blood that rushes to the muscle uh, in a superset is just, it's amplified. It's tremendous. Yeah, yeah. you get a phenomenal, this is why bodybuilders love doing supersets because they're always looking for that. Well, pump. this is why it's included in most of the hypertrophy phases in our programs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When the when the adaptation or the desired outcome of what we're chasing in that phase of the program is hypertrophy, sarcoplasmic hypertrophy, getting the pump, uh, it's an incredible tool. Mm -hmm. uh, but like any other tool, it, you can use it and you can abuse it. Uh, I for sure was a kid who abused this. I chased I did my first workout with supersets and had the most massive pump I ever had in my life. That's all I'm doing now. And now I fell in love <laughs> with it. And then I was Mr. Superset guy. Every time I trained, I always superset because I love the feeling of the pump. Now, like anything else, the body adapts and gets used to that. And then the the original benefits that I got from it initially start to diminish. 
And so if you are supersetting or using that tool, use it intermittently. And mm -hmm. like we pro the way we program it in our programs, it'll be in a phase. So you won't see supersetting any longer than about three weeks, maybe four mm -hmm. weeks tops inside the program. Then you'll phase out of it and do a more traditional straight sets where you have resting in between yeah. exercises. But incredible benefits, especially when chasing the pump, but like anything else in any tool, you know, the the more often and more regular you do it, the the the, the returns start to diminish, and you want to move and phase out of that. Yeah, one of my one of the other benefits of a superset, and this can't be understated. I think oftentimes we focus on the physiological response uh, from an exercise, like oh, this is good for strength and endurance and a pump or time, you know, build. And, and not just time. That's also a good point. I'm glad you brought that up. But there's another one. Uh, there are psychological benefits to working out, okay? And supersetting, uh, for example, sometimes I like to superset opposing muscles. Mm. I like to superset biceps with triceps or chest and back. Now, why? Because you get a massive, you look huge. Dude, if you're, <laughs> you're, 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 you're you grow three inches you on your, your arms. shirt like yeah. in it, two seconds. It feels yeah. phenomenal. You pump, I, I remember reading articles about this. That's like, a good point. One of it's Arnold's favorite supersets was uh, chin ups to bench press. He loved working lats and, and chest in, in a superset. And I don't know if there's necessarily any physiological benefits aside from the fact that you're moving from one to the other. I don't know if there's a benefit from the fact that you're working opposing muscle groups, but the fact that both sides of my body get a great pump, you know, psychologically speaking, it's fun. It's a lot of fun. And, and that definitely plays a role in training, you know, enjoying what See, you're doing. See, I, I look at it the same way that I, or at least how I use it now, the same way that I use tools like, like HIT training mm -hmm. or circuit training. It's like, a great tool, all kinds of great studies around the benefits behind it. Like anything else, if you do it all the time, then those those uh, benefits diminish. But use it when it makes the most sense. So, well, supersetting for me is great because it's a it's a great way to get a lot of volume in a short period of time. So, if I know today is a day where I like, you know, in a perfect world for me, I've got ninety minutes to two hours. Like that's where I can stroll in the gym mobility, walk on the treadmill, get my mindset right, like get hydrated, get into a great workout slowly, ramp up and then cool down. Like that's uh -huh. a perfect world for me. But that's not every day. Uh, that's a that's a blessing when that happens. A lot of times what ends up happening is, oh shit, I'm looking at my clock. Katrina told me uh, she needs me home by 4 cuz there's no one there for Max and it's already 3 right now. I'm already I've only got 60 minutes tops and I haven't even started yet. Today's a great day to do some supersets. Mm -hmm. Like I want to still accomplish uh, uh, all that volume, and I'm limited on time today to to keep up my my training regimen. Okay, well now I'm going to throw supersets. And guess what? Because I don't do it on a regular basis all the time, whoa, the body responds. Oh yeah. Here's here's three of my favorite ways to superset. So one is same body part, exercise to exercise. It really doesn't matter if they're you know, both compound, both isolation. It's just mm -hmm. fun to work on the same muscle with a different exercise without any rest in between the exercise. So that's one. The second one is opposing muscle groups. I just talked about that. Biceps and triceps, chest and back, quads and hamstrings, uh, phenomenal supersets. And the third way is known as a pre-exhaust pre superset. Yeah, yeah. That's I love and that this one. one was, I first learned about reading uh, the book called Heavy Duty by Mike Menser. And what he would talk about is doing a isolation movement on a muscle and then immediately going to a compound movement. So you pre-exhaust the muscle with an isolation movement. Mm -hmm. So let's say I do flies for my chest. Then I go to a bench press. You have to go way lighter on the second exercise. That's another great way to do a superset. Next question is from Sarah Gottfried. Do you think gamification like the Fitbit or closing your rings on the Apple Watch helps build long-term habits yeah, you know, if used right well yeah. uh dr andy galpin would would disagree so mm -hmm. there his, right. his his book unplugged it gets into this and um it's a, it's an interesting thought especially coming from the well, guy kind of creates a dependency on right some level. Yeah. so i mean and here's the example i'll use uh and i remember the first time that i was kind of challenging sal on this because i'm him and i are a lot like this if, if sal and i get in the car today it is the scariest thing ever. We have to be somewhere. This is this has happened, <laughs> right? Like this has happened to us, right? We just traveled to Arizona, and like him and I, like show up at the airport. I'm like, you have the itinerary? Do you have the itinerary? Like, where are yeah. we going? What time are we getting out of here? Do you know what the confirmation? Oh, fuck, I don't know. Yeah. You know, call Katrina. Fuck, you know. So that's that's him and I, right? And then we get in the car, and uh, you know, we have to sit there, put everything in navigation before we even turn it on because we know if we don't know exactly where it's at and it's put in there, we will get lost for oh, sure. Yeah. So now the the reason why I'm sharing that story is because. I wasn't always like this. 
In fact, um, you know, in my small group of friends, um, I was known as the guy who was really good at it. I had all everyone's phone numbers memorized. Mm -hmm. I could go to a place one time. I don't care how many turns I had to get. I could find it. I was really good at that. In fact, I took a lot of pride on it, and I was always the one who drove everybody because of that. And so, but I have completely lost that. And now I was also part of the generation or the people that hopped on the garments as soon as they came out in the Tom Toms. I thought they were f that was awesome. Those and are navig for the for people listening who are <laughs> GPS. Old, those yeah. are the first GPS devices yeah. you can find. Oh, yeah, yeah, and yeah. You, had to, you had to plug it into your cigarette lighter and you and you <laughs> suction cupped it to your window. And uh, so that was a I was one of the first yeah, people to have that. And um and I never stopped using it. Now and and so I've become dependent on it so much that if all of a sudden my iPhone, I lost it now or I didn't have it and I had to get somewhere and someone gave me an address in my own fucking city, could be five minutes from my house, I would be fucking freaking out. Yeah, you'd be yeah. screwed. And because I, so that same thing applies with these incredible tools like Fitbit, which I'm also somebody who is a big advocate for these tools because I think there, there is- There needs a, to be an exit plan. I, I like them for coaches. Yeah, I, I like them for coaches or people that are using them to learn about their body but then, it, it, like everything else, you want to detach from that uh, eventually, and you you want to get to the place, just like we talk yeah. about eating and tracking. You don't always want to have to enter your macros in. You want to get to the same place with your, your Fitbit yeah. and exercise. Well, what I do think is, and we're speaking to a large like fitness audience right now, just the way that we're talking, but I think for you know your average, everyday person that doesn't even really do anything, I've seen a lot of changes behaviorally, you know, with the general public with these types of things, like especially like, you know, the closing the loop thing I thought was like one of the most brilliant things they've come up with yet because of its simplicity. And I see people all the time getting up and doing shit just to close those things. And it's like this, this ritual that they've, you know, it's become a part of like what they do in order to mm -hmm. Finish it. However, you know, again, this is like the catalyst that's supposed to then spark you into, you know, you know, further improvement. So well, it's it's. I I wonder if it's a thing, and you know, we always talk about this stuff. Like we always talk and celebrate the thing, the what's why it's so great, and we don't always talk about the unintended consequences from it. Yeah, and you know, this is this is this gener the Fitbit generation and Apple Watch generation is right now. This isn't 20, 30, 40 years my, from now. My daughter wanted one for her birthday. Yeah, she okay. has a now. yeah so this, this is this generation right now. So we haven't seen what does the generation, you know, 20, 30 years from now look like. Yeah, does it do uh, anything at all for people right, long term? And, and will they be completely clueless? Okay, well, look at people today that try to get around town. They all use their Google Maps and they're completely uh, oblivious how to get around. I got yeah. a better example. Will it do more harm than good? I got an even better example than that. <clears throat> Nobody knows people's phone numbers today. You know the phone numbers I remember? I my mom's phone number because that's the one that I had since I was a kid. And to my best friends. I don't yeah, I don't even know I don't even know Jessica's phone number. I could not tell you if my phone broke I wouldn't be able to get a hold of her. I'd have to go find someone a cell phone and, and message her. I only on know Instagram. Courtney because that way I get the discounts at grocery now, store. Yeah. Now here, now it's because look here's the thing. Totally tools are that. only tools are only as good as you're, you, you use them. Okay, The way that you use them determines whether or not a tool is good or bad. These are tools. And if you use them to completely outs outsource a skill of yours, you have now become dependent. Just like I've become dependent on my phone to remember people's phone numbers. Because when I was a kid, I knew everybody's phone number. I knew all my aunt's phone numbers, my friends, my cousins, everybody's. Right. Just like we don't know where the hell we're going, although I never knew where the hell I was going. I was different <laughs> than, than you. I, gen I literally well, this have. This is the point I've always brought up with just having Google and search engines and everything. Like You you stop really trying to recall information. Like, that might be... A, that might that's be, a problem. There might be some well, truth to that. Now, and, and the like the near ILs and, and tech guys that would be in support of this would, would say things like, well, we're outsourcing things that we want outsourced that you don't want to have to think about in the future five, 10 years from now. That, sure. But you know, what is that atrophying? There's, there's, you know, our dads, right, uh, would say something like, I mean, I remember when my, my washer and dryer first broke yeah, down. Yeah, fix it yourself. Yeah. And he was just <laughs> angry at me because uh, I didn't want to go the lengths of trying to figure all that out. Now, in his time, when that stuff probably first came on the market, there wasn't even people to go fix those yeah, things. Sure. You know what I'm saying? Where now, it's like, I look at it and go like, wait a second, on my phone, I could have somebody here within 15 minutes, they'll fix it for a total of, you know, somewhere between 75 and 125. I make more than that per hour. 
why the fuck would yeah. I do it? It well, doesn't even make sense no, no, to no, me. You, you, know, you, you know what I'm saying? I know what you're saying. No, you, mo you both make really good points, but Justin said something that I, I want to go back to that I think was also a, a good point in that he, he said, what do we lose? So I'm going to use a very clear example that's very black and white. Let's say we outsourced our ability to walk. Let's say we developed equipment that literally. What do you mean? We already uh, are. You see no, no, no. the segways, the scooters and segways. No, no, no. But I mean, like it's so it was so good that walking would be stupid. I'd float everywhere because I have a machine strapped me. Yeah, that could literally happen. I would lose the part of my brain that controls my legs. What else did that connect to? There's downstream effects from that kind of stuff. Your brain's ability to f to navigate or remember certain things isn't just good to remember that specific thing. Well, that, I mean, well and I worry I'm more of like a freedom guy. Like what 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 why like is that freedom? Why why for me to be able to recall my own information and remember things like that, you know, alleviates my dependency on something else like telling me things. Like that, I can remember a lot better. That's no that's actually no different than the argument that I'm making with the washer and dryer. You're right. it's, it's the critical thinking side of the brain that yeah. you're you're getting rid of, yeah, right? right? So but but then the argument again uh, Dude, is what, what you maybe now your time is is used critical thinking for other things so it's still being stretched and exercised in that way totally just not for these things totally. that are mundane there's totally. a way you could use it to your benefit totally but more, in, but, think, but yeah, in but. the context of this question which was fitbits and, and those types of devices i think there's far more value in uh -huh. not uh, relying and outsourcing it completely yeah. i think using those to learn your own body because you're always going to be in your own body and the way we eat and the way we move is less of me paying attention and looking at things and reading things and more of how I naturally behave. And you'll never learn those skills unless your Fitbit made your food for you. Maybe that would be different, like where it, it's it's producing all your food for you and it's got all the perfect macros, but you're still making choices. Mm -hmm. And I think that that well, this is why they say too that like a, attention is going to be like attention in the future. The attention economy is is yeah. everything, yeah, right? Yeah. Because we everything we're we're creating for ourselves is allowing us to become more distracted and less present. And again, to like Ryan Holiday still in his key book, like that's going to be so crucial in the future because Sal, we're not far off from absolutely scooters and floating things that we won't have to people will look yeah. it will be like that soon. oh dude I, it's I, not we're not that far you yeah. have those what are those stupid oh, things you're still walking yeah User. right <laughs> I, I mean it, so you know you it, it will be important that you practice the skill of of becoming very present no matter how you wrap that up whether we're talking about directions fitbit tools i think that all applies becoming very aware and present is going to become extremely valuable for every, the skill to be able to do that is going to be a commodity. It's yeah. going to be very difficult for a lot of people to do in the yeah. future. Look, use your Fitbit and use these devices as training wheels. Use them as ways to learn. But then your goal should be to eventually be able to, to navigate your life and your nutrition, your activity uh, without those things. Apply uh, it yourself. Yeah. And you know what's funny? At the, at the, it makes me think, like, if there's ever, like, a solar flare that knocks out all the that, electricity. Again, yeah. Humans will go extinct. I'm so tinfoil sometimes yeah, when well, I think like, like that. Like, like we lose power. Yeah. We're, we can't have food. We don't know what to do. Yeah, I just want to have, like, basic skills. Yeah, yeah. we'll be... We'll yeah. For yeah. sure, if we ever have, like, a world war again, that's how it's going to go down. We're not going to use nukes on each other yeah, where everybody just turn dies. Off people's lives. Yeah, we'll just fuck <laughs> with everybody. It's like, it. yeah, boom, no lights. Yeah. Let them kill each other. You know what I'm saying? That's what already got me there. So, yeah. Anyway, with that, go to mindpumpfree.com and download all of our free books and free resources. Uh, you can actually get all of them, and they cost you nothing. You can also find the three of us, your favorite podcast hosts of all time, on Instagram. You can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin. You can find me at Mind Pump Sal, and Adam is at Mind Pump Adam.